Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Hi. Hi, we're broadcasting from Rachel's I made, pillow bunker. I made a pillow fort. <laughs> I can't even see your face because there's <laughs> so many pillows. I think this is going to really help with sound quality. And I think this is fun. And I won't make you do it ever again. <laughs> but I want to do it this way for now. <laughs> okay, welcome to an expert interview. We haven't had one of these in a little while. But this is a good one. This is a great one. A very well worth the wait on this expert interview. Would you like to just read Caroline's bio to begin? And then we can talk about what we got into with her. Okay. Caroline Garnett McGraw is an author, speaker, and coach who helps women who are really good at doing what they're supposed to do, start doing what they're meant to do. She's the creator of A Wish Come Clear, an online community of thousands trading perfectionism for possibility. You Don't Owe Anyone is Caroline's first book inspired by her viral essay on the Huffington Post. Caroline's writing has been featured on many major websites, including Momastery and Women for One. Caroline has given two popular TED Talks and keynote presentations across the country. She's created several interview series featuring New York Times bestselling authors Adam Grant, Amy Cuddy, Julie Barton, Rachel Macy Stafford, and Tal Ben-Shahar. In addition to her work coaching private clients, Caroline has served as a coach for one of Inc. 5000's fastest growing companies. Caroline lives in Florence, Alabama with her family. Um, So we talked to her about this first book that was many years in the making, has taken many forms, as you'll hear, and is a great big permission slip to people pleasers (laughs) to stop living their lives for someone else. So I think many of you are going to resonate with this and we get into some really powerful stories from Caroline's own life on why she needed this book for herself as much as she needed to write it for all of you. You really put a lot of emphasis on powerful. You didn't just say powerful. You went powerful. You went with the P. You really... Oh my God. Ew. You almost just spit on me and my mouth was open. You can't even see me through this pillow bunker. I can see three quarters of your face. I can see one of your eyes. That's how... (laughs) That's how ridiculous this is. Whatever. This is a really good episode and um, I... Like I said, people pleasers and perfectionists, which by the way, perfectionism is just a form of people pleasing. Yes. And... We went really deep. This is not just your surface level. Here are some tips and tricks. This really cut to kind of the core of why we do this and what blocks we have in letting go of those habits. And Caroline is really... She's come a long way in her own journey. I'm not going to spoil where she started because it's Mm kind of wild. So I hope that you guys will get inspired by this. And then I hope you might read her book. I really hope that a lot of people after this want to go pre-order her book because I just think it is so needed right now. I'm also thinking it's probably interesting. There's, there must be a few people listening who found us through Caroline because she's actually featured us a couple of times. That's and I true. know some people have come over into our community from hers. So this is kind of nice to be able to highlight her now in reverse. Full circle. Full circle. Share the love. Well, enjoy this conversation with Caroline, and we will be back at the end. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Hi, Rachel. Hi, Kristen. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy too, because we have been we have been on some of your shows before, but we haven't had you on our podcast. So it was about time. Yes, it's fun to switch seats. (laughs) I'm not really sure why we haven't had her on, but I think it was because we were waiting for her to write this book and we didn't know. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I, I want to start there a little bit. I, you were starting to tell us before we hit record about the process of writing this book. And obviously we'll get into what's in the book, but do you want to give us a little bit of a, a first intro to who you are, but then also what you have gone through to put this book out into the world? Because I think it might be very encouraging to people who have had a big dream for a long time. Mm, thank you. Yes, I'm happy to do that. And sorry if I'm a little bit froggy. I'm just getting over a cold. So if my voice sounds a little stuffy, that's why. Um, Glad it's not COVID. I'll take a cold over COVID anyway. Yeah, seriously. (laughs) No kidding. But yes, I am an author, a speaker, and a coach who's really focused on helping people trade perfectionism for possibility. So what that means is trade those old barriers, those old limiting beliefs for a more freeing existence. And it's ironic because the process of writing this book has been parallel to the journey that I help clients take, that I help readers take, in that I started writing it in 2015. I began writing it as a memoir. And it has turned into a very personal, personal development book, which I'm really happy with the result. But it went through so many different iterations along the way that there were times where I would despair of, is this ever going to be real? Is this ever going to be valuable? Is this, is this going to make a difference? And being willing to just stay with the mess and stay with the whole process is so much a part of the book itself, the message of the book itself. It's like, it is messy to create your own freedom, but stay with it, stay with it. And good things can happen on the other side. I know that's, um, (laughs) that is a hard, it's an easy thing to say after the fact. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to stick with something like that for a long time. And and you said this book is what, about six years in the making? Yes. I started writing the initial draft in 2015 and, you know, worked on that for quite a while by myself, hired an independent editor to help me fine tune it, then wrote the entire book proposal, which is basically, you know, a 50 page sales document that's separate from the book, pitched that proposal to various agents. Um, Actually, I'll say this for other authors, if this is supportive, I pitched 75 different agents. And wow. Yeah. So just in case people hit like five or 10, and nobody has said yes yet, that doesn't mean it's never going to happen. I have a friend who pitched over a hundred, you know, it's just, it's, it can be a laborious process. Uh, It turns out number 50 for me was the magic number, but she didn't get back to me until I'd sent 25 more out. So it was like, oh, okay. (laughs) Wow. Um, Talk about resilience. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Met with number 50. She's a perfect fit. I love her. And then began the process of shopping the book around to publishers completely rewrote the entire proposal again at the request of the publisher that we ultimately went with, Broadleaf Books. And so then, okay, I've completely rewritten the proposal twice. Then I completely rewrite the manuscript at least two, maybe three times after that. So (laughs) just an insane amount of work. Yeah. So when people say, oh, I wrote a book, uh, that's what they mean a lot Uh of the time. (laughs) Wow. Um, Okay, so I'm I'm thinking I'm I'm thinking that probably the process of writing this book brought up a lot of what you talk about in the book, sort mm-hmm. of in a meta sense. Um, but yes. I do want to get into the content of this book, which is called "You Don't Owe Anyone," which is just a really great title. Like, Thank period. Mm-hmm. Um, it tells you exactly what this book is going to be about without <laughs> me having to do any further investigation, which I love. And I also love all the things on the cover of the book that mm-hmm. we don't owe. Can Kristen, can you read a few of those, yes. please, to people? These are so good. I want to read them all, but I'll just choose a yeah, few choose select a few. ones. You don't owe anyone the perfect girl. You don't owe anyone a brave face. You don't owe anyone an explanation. You don't owe anyone an interaction. You don't owe anyone, period. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a few, but so, so good. I mean, the title itself is so permission giving. Yep. Mm. A permission slip. And I'm, I'm curious, 
What led you to call it that? It's a funny story because it was not originally called that. It went through multiple different titles. When it was a memoir, it was called Past Perfect, which I still kind of love because it's, you know, it's the play on words of the past perfect tense is what a lot of memoirs are written in. And it was about Mm -hmm. getting past perfectionism. So my nerdy English major self was very Mm -hmm. attached to that as the title. But ultimately what happened, thanks to the suggestion of a great editor, um, Lil Copen at Broadleaf Books, she just said, you know what, your Huffington Post piece that you published in 2015, it went viral, it went crazy. It's called You Don't Owe Anyone an Interaction. And she said, what if you took that as the basis for the book and set it up in a way that centered around that concept? Because we know that concept resonates with people. We know that that is a very strong, you know, that speaks to people. And of course, at that point, I wanted to kind of hit my head against a wall and be like, why didn't I think of that? I wrote that (laughs) years ago. It had never occurred to me that that could be the foundation of the book itself. But as soon as she said it, I realized, oh, I can take each of these stories that I was trying to tell in the memoir and take them through the lens of what you don't owe someone. So as Kristen read, okay, you don't owe anyone your time and energy. What are the stories from my own life that reflect Mm -hmm. that truth or that exploration? So that's how the structure came to be. The cover has the chapter titles. Each chapter is you don't Mm. owe something. Um, And it's all about what does this actually look like in a real life? Because whenever I read personal development, it's like, yeah, it's all well and good to hear something like, oh, say no, set boundaries, Mm -hmm. Um, don't be all things to all people, Um, let go of people pleasing. Okay, great. Yes, I agree with those intellectually, but I want to know what that actually looks and feels like. I want to see that. You need to show me that. So that's what the book endeavors to do, is to actually show those things in action. So... One of the, in your copy, in your marketing copy that you've been working on for promoting your book, one of the um, little factoids you've been dropping casually that is <laughs> that worked on me <laughs> is like, yeah, I'm really good at this. Like I, I learned how to be the perfect, you know, the perfect people pleaser, the perfect, you know, Um, Like, don't have needs. And, you know, I learned to owe people a lot before I learned to not owe people anything. Mm. And your example is, I used to be in a cult. And I'm like, okay, well, if that was the only reason I read this book, that would be, that would, like, that would be enough to to hook me into reading a book. It's like, okay, Mm. well, how did you go from that mentality? Because we know what that mentality is like to this mentality. So I think people are going to want to hear a little bit more about how you became the person who then needed the content in this book. Yes. Yes. I'm so glad you asked that. Because when I was taking my first pass at writing the the elevator pitch, the marketing copy, all of that, I was definitely doing it in my formal good girl voice. And the mentor that I was working with at the time sort of gently shook me out of that and was like, no, just tell me, just talk to me about this book. Just say it in your own voice. Just you know, be casual with it. And one of the sentences that came out of my mouth was, I was in a cult and I was good at it. And he was like, you have to put that in. That's yeah, interesting. That's a great <laughs> tagline. First of all, it was just great marketing. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So that, that definitely didn't come from, oh, I need to do this right. It was just a casual conversation. And I realized, oh, actually, yeah, I'd read that book too. If somebody said that to me, I'd be interested. So yes, when I was... The story begins really when I was five years old and my younger brother, Willie, was three. Um, He was diagnosed with autism, with an autism spectrum disorder. And at the time that that happened, the rate of autism in the US was about one in 10,000. So autism awareness was nothing like it is today. It was just Mm -hmm. this unknown, unheard of thing. Um, And in the midst of that, in the wake of that, you know, there was a lot of soul searching going on for my parents, for me as this five-year-old. What does this mean? What what is our life going to look like? And my mom began attending church. A friend had invited her. And so when I was about six, I started attending services at the Worldwide Church of God, 
which is the cult that I refer to in the book. So it didn't occur to me until I was an adult, you know, probably in my early 20s to Google this church that had been such a part of my childhood. I'd attended, you know, from age six until I went off to college. And I started reading about it. I started reading about the history from an outside perspective. And what I found was just completely shocking to me um, in the sense of like nobody, I've, I've realized this as I did more reading, nobody thinks that they're the one in a cult. Like you always think it's mm-hmm. somebody, it's somebody else. Like surely the people I know and the church that I belong to, surely that could never be some kind of scary, like a, a cult is such a loaded word. It's such a scary big word. Um, but what I learned was that the stereotype of, you know, like suicide cults and the, the kind that make the news that are really dramatic, that's just a very extreme version of the, the actual definition, which is an environment that is based all around control. It's all about controlling a member's thoughts, feelings, behaviors. It's about making the cult the center of their world. It's about unquestioning obedience. It's about the environment. So you can have, you can have a cult that their teachings can be kind of wacky, but their environment is healthier. Or you can have a cult whose teachings are very orthodox or mainstream, but the culture and the behaviors surrounding them are very dysfunctional and unhealthy. So in my case, it was a pretty wacky set of doctrines, plus a lot of relationship dysfunction and a lot of control um, and a controlling environment. But again, when you're a little kid, you take for granted, this is just the way things are. This is from age six on, this is what I knew. Um, And so part of the book is a coming to terms with that and an awakening around that of, oh my goodness, letting myself see all of the things that I'd swept under the rug and just said, hmm, okay, well, I know that's kind of weird, but I don't know what to do with that. So, okay, I guess I'm just not going to talk about it. And so for me, part of You Don't Owe Anyone was you don't owe anyone this tidy, neat, tied with a bow version of your story, you can share the messy parts of, wow, I didn't know, I didn't understand, and I'm still making sense of all of it. Wow. I know that was Um, a lot. (laughs) No, 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 no. I love it. Um, And I think what I'm curious about is, and I think I'm asking because I'm like thinking, what what are other people going to want to know more about? (laughs) And like... You were in that situation from basically the time you have memories, maybe Mm -hmm. a little after that. So it completely shaped your, the way your brain formed, like your brain was growing while in that, you know, dysfunctional, to say the least environment. Yes. So how did it train you? Like, Mm. how did you learn to think about yourself as a result of being in that environment? Mm, That's such a good question. Yeah. For me, the, I think the thing that comes through first and foremost was that you are trained to think in either or, in black and white, in all or nothing. Yep. That is the biggest pitfall that I still work to overcome, that I still default to if I'm stressed out, that you know, I still go to... My brain is very familiar with that of, okay, you're either one of, one of the chosen, one of the saved, or you're going to the lake of fire. You're either all good and you did it perfectly or you completely failed and you should feel terrible about yourself. Um, so operating in those, in those extremes. Um, and I think you do make a great point that it's different for a child than it is for an adult in that environment because adults are sometimes a bit better at taking things with a grain of salt of, oh yeah, they say, you know, they say to do all these things, but you know, I can bend the rules here and there, but to a perfectionist kind of eager to please kid, I just saw it as this is what you have to do. They, okay, you have to fast on this day. I have to fast on this day. You can't wear Halloween costumes because Halloween is the devil's holiday. That's what you have to do. Um, There are some interesting moments in the book though, where my... I don't know what the word is, skepticism, rebelliousness 
comes out. And I, I do question at certain points and at certain scenes, you know, wait, I don't understand. Why does it have to be this way? And so for me, healing and recovery and overcoming that black and white thinking has meant getting in touch with that part of me that it was always there. It kind of got buried under all of the rules and shoulds and have tos. But that innocent child voice asking, you know, for example, asking my mom, why is it not okay to dress up for Halloween? Because sometimes we play dress up and it's, it's just like dress up. Why, why mm-hmm. is it bad? And just having that sense of like, I don't, I don't understand this. This doesn't actually make sense. So getting back in touch with, with that clear eyed little kid mm-hmm. is a major part of my own work. And it's a part of the book and the exercises that are in there too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's huge to recognize. You've always had this questioning part, but it just, it got stifled by yeah. all these rules and by trying to figure out what am I supposed to do? What's the right thing to do? What do I owe to all these people who have been taking care of me and supporting me? And you got all of those rules very clearly spoken to you, right? Like you may Mm -hmm. not wear a Halloween costume. You cannot eat on this day, right? Like there was, Mm -hmm. and yet I'm thinking we have a, we have a lot of people pleasers in our audience who they took on a lot of the things from their own childhood and growing up as almost as mandates in the same Mm -hmm. way that you're describing, even if they weren't spoken, some of those things as directly as, as you were. And I have to imagine it's, it's so hard recognizing you don't owe anyone all of these aspects of yourself is one thing. But when you have grown up feeling like that's expected of me, that's what makes me a good person. That's what makes me lovable. That's what makes me belong. And then deciding I actually don't owe that to someone else. I, I maybe owe it more to myself has got to come with so much discomfort. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Self, so you feel, much. You feel selfish, you yes. feel ashamed. So I wonder if you could share some of your experiences with the backlash that you faced, even internally, of, of breaking those rules that you so ascribed to growing up of your community or what was just the right thing to do. Yes. Yes. You hit the nail on the head. That's a, that's a perfect way of saying it. The, the great thing about getting older and, you know, being 35 at the time of this recording, it's like, I finally was in enough pain from obeying all of those inner rules and mandates that the pain of doing that eventually outweighed the discomfort of going against my patterning. So Mm -hmm. when I was younger, you know, 18, 20s, all of that, it's like, I hadn't been in enough pain yet, but it sounds strange to say it this way, but I think a lot of people can relate to this. It's like when the pain level gets great enough, you are very motivated to change. You are very motivated to look at your beliefs and look at like, what is causing me to live in this way that makes me suffer and makes me miserable. Um, So in that way, you can look at if you are if you are like me, if you tend to be an overachieving, hard worker, perfectionist, in a way that can be a path to your freedom and your liberation because you will probably overdo it sooner rather than later. And you will, your wake up call will come fairly quickly. Um, and so I talk about a few of those moments in the book, like being in a car accident. Um, the one that catalyzed you don't owe anyone I'll just tell the the very brief story. I got this series of Facebook messages from an old acquaintance and they were just very cryptic, very short. And all they said was, I miss you. I miss you. I really miss you. And Mm -hmm. the last time I'd seen this person, they, you know, they were drunk. They made a pass at me. It was like kind of uncomfortable. Um, And this is years later, just getting these random messages on Facebook. And I was conflicted actually about what to do in that moment because of course there was the part of me that went, "Mm, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm just not, I don't want to answer. But then almost automatically that part kicked in of, well, 
you need to be kind. You need to be generous. You need to be, you know, you need to be sensitive. What if he's really going through something, you know, like, what if it really mm-hmm. matters that you reply? And all of those, all of those conditioned voices kicked in of like, this is how you should show up. You should always be perfectly kind and welcoming. And it, it doesn't matter how uncomfortable it makes you, right? It's like, it's all about, you have to live up to this ideal, even if it doesn't feel right. And so at least I had enough presence of mind in that moment to feel the discomfort. Like that's the first step of just becoming aware of how very uncomfortable it is to have all of those shoulds and ohs and have tos going through your mind. And I went and I asked my husband what he thought about it, which was kind of a cop out because I could predict what he was going to say. I, of he, course, he's going to be like, don't talk to that weird guy. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> exactly. It was like, I, I could anticipate his reaction to this was not going to be positive. Um, but he's been, he's been a wonderful partner for me because he does not struggle with the idea that you owe people interactions. And that's what he said to me. And he didn't say, don't reply or are you crazy or anything like that. He just looked me in the eye and said, you don't owe anyone an interaction. Mm. And I loved that moment so much because he, he went underneath the surface and he pinpointed the belief that was keeping me stuck. Mm -hmm. And it was this belief that I owed this guy something. And I was like, oh my God. And all of a sudden, as he said that, I was able to look at my whole life through that lens of, wow, how much time have I wasted believing that I owed people things that I don't actually owe them? And Mm -hmm. to draw the parallel to the cult experience that we were talking about earlier... I had just seen the pilot episode for The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Oh my gosh. And the best show ever. <laughs> <laughs> Which like, it's actually funny because I've only ever seen the pilot because it shook me up so much that I was like... Oh yeah, maybe maybe too close to oh, comfort. Yeah. <laughs> Even Perhaps though it's so, so surreal as a show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in the pilot, I mean, it's it's hyperbolic, of course, but they talk to these women who have been a part of this small cult in like an underground bunker for years. And they ask them, well, like, how did you get involved? How did you get here? Like, what happened to you? And one of them says, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but this reverend guy came up to me in the parking lot and asked me something and I didn't want to be rude. So Mm -hmm. here I am. Mm -hmm. It's basically like, I didn't want to be rude. So I spent 10 years of my life trapped in an underground bunker. Right, right. I got kidnapped because I was so afraid of being impolite. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that was that was kind of the, the clarion call for me of like, I have to write about this because so many of us are paying too high of a price for, I can't be rude. I have to be nice. And we so, get stuck in literal or metaphorical bunkers. So um, <laughs> you, you alluded to that earlier and I want to go right at it where you said, I was in a lot of pain and it got to the point where I was only motivated to change once the pain reached a certain threshold. Yes. So I would love for you to talk more about the pain because I think that's how people are going to... They're, listen, if they're listening to this, they probably already see some of themselves in this story and in feeling like they do owe people. But I like to go right at it and call it right out so that they can't possibly listen to this and then pretend <laughs> like mm. they can go on with their lives as normal after this. So what was the pain that you were in so that people can recognize the pain they might be in too? Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a really good question. And no one's asked it quite that way to me yet. So I think the first thing I would say actually is, for me at least, everyone is different, but there's this, there's this deep level of pain that comes from being very numb and not being able to feel very much at all. So if you're not able to feel very much at all, which is often connected with depression, clinical or not, it's like that is a big sign that you are in pain. Like if you are numbed, if you are shut down, there is some serious pain underneath that it needs to be looked at gently and, you know, ideally professionally supported and everything. But not feeling much of anything, it sounds counterintuitive, but that's actually kind of the most painful Well, it clearly shows you're trying to protect yourself from something, right? You're trying to insulate yourself from 
something. And it's the only thing you can do is to just shut down. Yeah. And it which really is, takes you out of the whole point of the human experience, which is to be here and experiencing it. To, and, ba- and to feel. To feel, feel it. To feel every part of it. And when you feel numb, you almost feel like a robot. Like, why am I, like, what's even the point of, <laughs> I mean, like the big existential questions start to get heavy at that point. Mm. Well, also I feel like not to take this on a tangent, but I think this is a good tangent. I'm not going to forget the original question, but <laughs> um, I think that when, you know, we keep going back to the cult, but like whether you're in a literal cult or you've just been indoctrinated by common beliefs and um cultural stuff that you've inherited, a lot of the message that we get is that we matter less than other people. Our needs are either non-existent or secondary to that of making sure everyone else has what they need and that they are comfortable. And so a lifetime of like feeling like I am less of a person means that you become less and less and less and less like sure of yourself and less attached to your own identity and less sure of like, what do I want and who am I? And so I feel like it makes you less attached to your pain too, because you can't Mm. even realize, like if I can't point a finger to what I want or what I value or what makes me me, then I probably also can't recognize why I am in pain. Like, Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so we end up having all of this pain and all these experiences building up that we can't process and it becomes overwhelming. And so we just become completely disconnected from ourselves. And that to me is part of the numbness and the depression that you're talking about. Yes. Yes, I agree a hundred percent that it's this vicious cycle of your distance from life, your distance from yourself. And it's very frustrating because you want to engage, you want to be alive, but there's just this wall. It's like, I, I can't get there. Um, on a really practical level, your body starts breaking down, you get sick. Yep. A lot more Mm -hmm. often. um, Yep. You're internalizing so much Mm -hmm. that's not getting out. So yeah, where where else is it going to go? It's got to go somewhere. So it turns inward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the book, I talk about how I got shingles when I was 22. And going to the doctor and him diagnosing it very easily and quickly and me saying, I'm 22. I thought thought only old people got that. And Mm -hmm. his response was, well that's the stereotype, but this is DC. And he said, I see a lot of cases, especially in politicians. And I had this moment of awareness when he said that, which I was not working as a politician at the time. I was a live-in caregiver for adults with special needs. But as soon as he said that, I thought, oh, I have been living my life like I'm on some kind of endless campaign trail. Like Mm -hmm. that's what my life is like. So I kind of am a politician, only I'm campaigning for approval for love, not for like an actual political office. Um, Mm -hmm. So if your body starts breaking down, that's another really good indicator. It's time to take a look at things. Yeah. And if you're campaigning for a political office, eventually there's an election and either you win or you (laughs) lost. When you're campaigning for love and belonging and feeling enough, it's never, you no. never reach the end point. Constant stress cycle. Constant. constant. And, and no end in sight because the part of you that's craving that the most never is satisfied. It's like an endless pit. Mm-hmm. So you got to break the cycle or else you're going to implode. <laughs> okay. So yeah. those are two, those are two layers of pain. Are there more other kind other kinds of ways you were suffering? Mm. Yeah. The, the story that comes to mind there is when I decided to leave my job as a nonprofit program director. And I was, I was struggling with this. Every day I would get up and I would make myself go to this job, which was in many ways a really good job with really good people. Like There were a lot of great things about it, but it wasn't the right job for me. And I knew that. I knew that almost from the beginning. But I stayed for more than two years partly because it was a good job, but partly because I was like, I should be the person for whom this is the right fit. Like I had that belief. (laughs) And so to answer your question about what kind of, what other kinds of pain are there? There's the pain of constantly denying who you truly are and how you truly feel and what you think and what you prefer and how you operate and all of that. And I didn't actually put this in the book, but I'll share this with you guys just as a kind of exclusive. 
<laughs> there, <laughs> there was this training that my supervisor asked me to go to. And everything in me just said no. Like it was a hell no. Like everything about this training, it was like Medicaid compliance. It was a, oh God. <laughs> a long way away. It was, it was just going to be a nightmare. And I knew it was going to be a nightmare. And so I asked, okay, I, I resentfully agreed to do this. Then I rescheduled it. Then I got what seemed like the flu when I was supposed to go to this mm-hmm. training. But the whole time I was like, this is totally psychosomatic. I feel all of it, but I know my body is just saying, no, you're not doing this. And the third time I was supposed to go, I just woke up that morning and I suddenly found that I could not make myself do it, which was thrilling but terrifying at the same time. I was like, (laughs) I can't make myself leave this apartment. So another indicator that the pain is, is getting to be enough for change is like you suddenly stop being able to do the things that you used to force yourself to do. And that's what happened to yeah. me. And you know, being a person who does her best to live with integrity, I quit the next day. I let my supervisor know, you know, I I wasn't able to go to this training, and the reason is because I need to leave this job. Like, I'm not going to lie and say I went when I didn't. Like, this isn't this isn't right for me. Um, so this sounds like a paradox, but I, I hope this actually gives some listeners hope because a lot of times what happens when we can't fulfill our old roles anymore, it's like we freak out and we panic of, I have to make myself do this. I have to, I just have to do it. But every indicator from your body, your mind, your spirit is like, no, no, this this way is closed to you. You cannot go down this road anymore. That's actually a good thing. So trying and seeing that as your life is trying to guide you in a benevolent way. it doesn't have to be a disaster, even though it, it feels like one in the moment. That story is also proof that if you keep trying to owe everyone everything, eventually a part of you will revolt. Mm-hmm. Now, you don't have to push yourself that far. Your body will revolt. Yeah, your mind will revolt. Every, everything, everything will Everything will be revolt. like, nope, I can't anymore. Uh, so you can't push yourself but so far because at some point you will hit a breaking point. It's just impossible not to. Yes. Um, but I love that you're giving people permission to not get themselves to that point. Yes. To say, you didn't owe anyone, you didn't, even though that was your job, right? And your boss asked you to go to that training. You didn't owe anyone that training, that time, and that mm-hmm. energy. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, your body and mind were like, nope, that's it. That's That's the end. So can we speak straight to like the fear that I hear people thinking as they're listening to this, which makes me sound omniscient and maybe I am. (laughs) Um, I hear people saying, oh, I really want to do that, but I'm so afraid of being seen as selfish or feeling selfish or feeling like, doesn't that make me a good person? Mm -hmm. So like, how have you had to learn to rethink about things that you used to think were selfish or that you, you would have thought that makes me a bad person if I won't do that or if I decide I'm not owing that to somebody. Yes, I think about this a lot. This is, this is one of my favorite things to ponder and to talk about. The first thing that helped me was hearing from Liz Gilbert that I believe it's in Mandarin. There are two different words for selfish and one of them translates to be greedy or to be hoarding, like to be a taker. But the other one translates to be good to yourself, Mm -hmm. to be generous to yourself. I find that distinction really freeing because if you are actively trying to take things that belong to other people, like if if you believe other people owe you their time, their energy, their love, Mm -hmm. all of that, yeah, that does qualify as selfish. But if what you're doing is stewarding your own time, energy, resources, making decisions about things that actually belong to you. That is not selfish. Mm -hmm. You know what this brings to mind? There are phrases I've heard recently that are going to make people feel very called out and I hope in a good way. (laughs) Um, There's two kinds of narcissism. There's overt Mm -hmm. narcissism and there's covert narcissism. Mm. 
overt narcissism is what you just said about being a taker, like feeling like everyone owes me something because I'm somehow so uniquely special that everyone owes me their time and their energy and their money. And I'm kind of like a black hole in which, you know, I'm going to suck it all up and it's never going to be enough. And then, however, if you are a match to that kind of person, because like attracts like. So Mm. if you're like, I, you know, those people tend to find me. Energy vampires tend to find me because I will give and give and give and give. And I feel like I'm distinctly not enough. And so therefore I have to prove my worth and I have to be likable. That's equally narcissistic. It's just over, it's just covertly narcissistic, which mm. is going to blow people's minds because they think what they're doing is being the exact opposite of narcissistic. They're being selfless, right? They're still getting all their needs met from someone else. They're kind of using that other narcissist, the other version of narcissism to get all of their own worth needs met. And so like technically both of those fall into that one definition of selfish where you are kind of taking from other people. It's just sometimes Mm -hmm. you're taking very clearly and- Resources and time time. as opposed to- validation. Yeah. Sometimes it's a little bit subtler, but it's still there. I, I man, this makes me wish we had two words for selfish mm-hmm. in this English. country because one, it's right. You're right. That's the, that's the biggest backlash question I always get from people when it's about setting boundaries or it's about saying no to things or taking back their time in some ways they feel selfish. It's like, what if, what if selfish didn't have to mean being a taker, being someone who value values yourself above others? What if it was just, you value yourself as much as you value everyone else. And you also deserve time and energy and resources Mm -hmm. and love. And you can give that to yourself and should. Yes. I love this conversation. I totally agree. And I love that you pointed out the the subtleties there of if you're relying on other people for their approval, their, you know, their good opinion, it's like, yes, in a sense, you are using them. It just mm-hmm. looks different than the stereotypical overt narcissist. Um, yeah. And if, if I'm, you know, as I was writing something that came to mind, um, one of the gifts of growing up in the church that I did was that I can pretty much always put a biblical passage to an example. It's like, that, <laughs> that's totally my, like my frame of reference. And there's this great parable in the New Testament that Jesus tells. And it's about this landowner who hires people to work on his land. And he pays them all the same wages, even though some people start work early and some people start work later. And everyone gets really upset with him. They're like, oh my gosh, that's not fair. Like, how could you do that? That's, it's totally unfair that you gave the same amount when people work different hours. And the landowner's response is, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? (laughs) Which I'm just like, damn, why doesn't that story get told more? (laughs) You know what I mean? Right. (laughs) Right. Right. Wild. And also... I wonder if that same landowner would be like, well, they didn't ask for a raise. Mm, Like those people negotiated a different rate with me. And I said, yes. Yeah. Right. And it's my resources and I'll do what I want, how I want. Yeah. I don't owe anyone in other words. And you don't have to work for me if you don't like it. (laughs) Totally. Totally. (laughs) That's great. So my last, I mean, like I could go on and on, but my last big question for you is I'm guessing that the reason it took you so long to make this sort of transition into this totally new way of existing is that you were so afraid of what the fallout would be and of who you would have to be and all the hard things and all of the discomfort you'd have to go through in order to get there. And I'm sure it did come with that. And I'm pretty sure I know what you're going to say, but I got to ask it anyway. (laughs) Um, Was it worse than living the way you lived for like 30 some years of your life? Mm. Oh, yeah. You ask such good questions. I love that you're asking this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not that I'm not that I'm going to keep keep on quoting the Bible, but there's another great line in there that talks about what does it profit you if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? And oh, like, that's a yeah. good one, man. The Bible does have some bangers. It's got some gems, right? <laughs> yeah. Some tweetables. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I haven't actually read it in a long time, but these are just like in my head. So 
Um, but yeah, exactly. It's, it's that same concept of if you get everything you ever thought you wanted, but you lose the essence of yourself, you lose your humanity, you, you lose all the things we've been talking about, then like, is it worth it? No, sorry, it's not. And in so many ways, by the time, by the time I got to my thirties, it's like I had, I had achieved a lot of the things I set out to achieve, but it was that question of, well, why do I still feel small? Like, why do I still feel, um, the term I like to use is like one down from other people, like other adults are up here and I'm like a level down looking up at them. Why do I still feel that way? And a lot of it is what we've been talking about, like, because you were not taught to stand on an equal footing and to, you know, honor your own needs, your own your own gifts and, and time and energy and all of that, you were taught to just give it all away indiscriminately to anybody who said that they needed it from you. Um, and so a, a big theme of the book is being able to take care of that younger part of yourself and to reparent that younger part of yourself and be the parent for yourself now that you needed back then, um, which I find profoundly hopeful because it's like so many of us, even if you were never a part of a cult or anything like that, it's, you know, you've been in an environment where you weren't seen, you weren't heard, you weren't supported and being told, you know, this is just the way it has to be. And now as an adult, being able to, to go back and reclaim and talk to that person that you were, be like, Hey, I'm here for you now. It gets to be different now. It's almost like you have to bring yourself up to speed about what is real because there's a part of you, or at least there was a part of me that was still operating as though I'm this six-year-old who has to go along with, okay, it's no costumes. So I guess what I want doesn't matter. We can't do costumes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like, no, no, no. (laughs) You're a grown up now. You can do whatever you want. You can dress up however you want. That time is over, you know? So updating the messages that are operating and letting yourself know, hey, I've got you now. You're, you don't have to obey all those same rules that you used to. I'm, I'm so glad that you have given yourself this permission, especially coming, uh, coming from the extreme uh, kind of orthodox kind of viewpoint that you came up with. And I know some of our people <laughs> need this permission as well. Uh, so I'm so glad you've given some of these examples. But really what I want is for a lot of our listeners to go get your book. So it's in it's in I pre-sale right now. Um, I, Can I say one more thing about sure. why I want them to read it? Yes. Book? Because I think there's a lot of like, frankly, bullshit personal development books out there that are very service level about like, hey, and I'm saying this very on the nose, but like slightly off so that people <laughs> won't come at me. Like, hey girl, take a bubble bath. Um, I think Caroline knows what I'm talking about. And Uh I'm like, yeah, that's like, okay. That's like pink boa self-care. That's like the tip of the iceberg. And Caroline's like, no, can we just talk about what's submerged under the surface? Because this is what actual like self, when people say you need to love yourself, this is what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. And this is hard. This isn't Mm -hmm. like, this isn't just like having like a self-care routine. This is grappling with everything that makes me feel like I'm less than other people. And that makes me feel like, you know, my needs aren't as important and that I'm, I owe things to people that I don't owe. Like that's the real work in, if you can undo that, then that is an act of supreme self-care and self-love, which is why I think this book is a much deeper and better form of caring for yourself well, than some yeah, of that other crap. And the fact that, you know, Caroline, you're giving so many great personal stories. This is not just a prescriptive book. You're not telling people, do this and then do that. Right. You're saying like, mm. I get it. I've been in the trenches and here's my experiences of sometimes doing it well and sometimes not doing it so well. But let me try to model some of this so it feels a little bit more accessible. Yes. And I think that's really, uh, it makes it a lot more of an approachable thing for people to, to try to face on their own. So I really, really encourage people to go pre-order the book, which when is come officially out? coming out, I believe, April, April 20th. 20th. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we've got a couple of months. All right. So tell us more about the, you know, like if people pre-order it, what's the deal? Yes. 
yes, before I do, I just want to say thank you both so much for of that, course. for that encouragement. Um, because I, I really agree with what you're saying in, in the intro, I talk about, you know, a lot of times the person who I would love to read this book is the person who understands all of that well-meaning guidance about just take good care of yourself. Just go for a walk. Mm -hmm. Just do the, it's that simple. Just be nice to yourself. And it's right. like, as if taking a walk is going to undo like all of the decades. conditioning from my cult, you know? Yeah, like, okay, it, I'll do some bird watching. And it's like frustrating for them because um, mentally you understand that. You're like, okay, yeah, nature, positive ions or whatever, negative ions. Great. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. I understand. But when it comes to actually doing that, there's all of this inner resistance. There's all of this, all this stuff. And even if like you get to a point where I got to, I was doing a good job taking care of myself on the surface. You know, I would meditate. I would, you know, I checked all those boxes too, but there was still a whole other layer under the surface, like you were saying, um, that I had not explored yet. It's like, you can do all these practices, but if, if the heart of it isn't addressed, then it's still going to nag at you. So I say that in a hopeful spirit of like, if you are a smart person who are who has been frustrated by like, but I do all the things I'm supposed to do to take care of myself and I still feel like I owe the whole world and I'm exhausted, then this might be a good book for you to read. So mm -hmm. with all of that said, the pre-order goodies, um, if you pre-order the book between now and April 20th, I basically give you my entire virtual library which includes over a hundred expert interviews, including an interview with Rachel and Kristen, and just an interview with Kristen as well, um, as like a you don't owe anyone practical crash course of here's how this looks in other people's lives, not just in my life, right? Because yes, I hope my example is helpful, but there are so many other voices I can bring to the conversation. There's also a coaching guidebook where I compile all of the, they're called no-o invitations in the book, like suggestions of things that you could try if you find mm. yourself feeling trapped and stifled and exhausted. Here are some, some things that might be helpful to you. So I put that all together in one packet for you if you pre-order. So it definitely makes sense to do that. There is a link in our show notes where you can do that, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and you can also just go to our site and hit the podcast tab and you can find this episode there and look at the show notes. Um, we hope that you guys will band together and <laughs> read this book um, because just this conversation it, it itself was fascinating. It was like a tiny skimming of the surface of what's on offer. So um, thank you so much for having this conversation with us. And we hope that thank you for writing this book. I know it's taken yeah. a lot of your time and energy over the years, but um, I think it's very needed. And I, mm -hmm. I think it's going to support so many people in coming yeah. back to themselves and reprioritizing their yeah. needs. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm grateful to you for giving people this big permission yeah, for slip. sharing your story, which is very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I know. Yes. Um, so kudos to you for, for, you know what, not owing anyone, like I have to write a book that pleases everyone because I'm going to write a book and it might piss some people off and yeah. I don't owe them anything. Yeah. So here's yes. my story. Deal with it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Thank you so much. That was, you're that has been something I've grappled with that there are going to be people who read this and are comforted and encouraged and feel like, oh my gosh, she sees me, she gets it. And then there are going to be people who read it and are really pissed off, like you said. Mm -hmm. So I've had to prepare for that and live the message of the book of like, yeah, you know, I I get to write what it was like for me and I don't owe anyone their version of the story. Yeah. And talk the, about walking your talk. And the right people will resonate. Yep. You know? Yeah. So thank you. And we can't wait to hear like let's hope it just becomes an instant bestseller. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I love talking to you. <laughs> Bye, Caroline. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. I just ahead. realized that <laughs> I introduced this episode talking about the pillow bunker that Rachel and I are currently in. She wanted to test this sound quality thing. 
And then we actually referenced the bunker from Kimmy Schmidt in the episode. And how that triggered Caroline. <laughs> that triggered Caroline it. and now I feel bad. <laughs> We're very safe in our bunker. There's nothing scary going on here. Um, and, you, you know, to each their own, it's fine. <laughs> Kimmy Schmidt is not particularly traumatizing, I, I don't think. I think she would have been okay if she kept watching it. But that, that's also fine. She has her boundaries. Um, I hope you guys got a lot out of that. I hope you'll go pre-order her book. Um, and we will be back. What? We'll be back on, on Tuesday, Tuesday. And we've got a very big announcement that we teased a few weeks ago. And then we pulled back the tease and now we're teasing it again because it's actually happening on Tuesday. Yeah, but this time I'm going to follow through. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So that's kind of the definition of a tease though. You know what I mean? Like we teased and then we didn't follow through. That's exactly the definition of a tease. Yeah. Yeah, but now we're going to go to home base. (laughs) So So definitely come back on Tuesday because you're going to want to hear what we're sharing. It's going to affect you. It's Big. It's pretty big. It's a thing that's been percolating, percolating for years. Years. It's finally happening. And it will affect you positively, I believe. I hope so. Or neutrally, if you no, choose neutrally. not to engage. Not in negatively. Way. It will not, I very much hope, <laughs> impact you negatively. Or else, why are we doing it? Um, okay, if that was enough of a tease for you, we'll see you on Tuesday. Bye. See you then.